It's not uncommon for a spiritual awakening to shake us to our core, rattle our foundations, rearrange the way we experience and understand everything. Most of you have probably had the experience at one time or another, perhaps even this morning, of being awoken by a harsh sound from an alarm clock or your smartphone. And you raise one eyelid, squint in the half light or still dark of the room in which you're sleeping, reach out a hand to hit the snooze button or even swat the offending noisemaker from its perch and across the room. Just waking up in the morning can be very harsh. You just want to hit the snooze button and roll over, if not break the offending noise-making alarm. Spiritual awakenings can be just as difficult. It's not uncommon for a spiritual awakening to shake us to our core, rattle our foundations, rearrange the way we experience and understand everything. Spiritual awakening can be more like the aftermath of an earthquake than a blissful, meditative, peaceful floating away to nirvana. And in its aftermath, everything can change. Many white people have had a spiritual awakening in recent years brought on by the unlearning of racism and coming to understand the omnipresence of white supremacy in our culture and our nation's history. And once you wake up to something like that, it is very difficult to go back to sleep. Once you see, it is hard to unsee. Once you understand, you can't return to unknowing. In my work as a spiritual director, one issue I run into with many clients is that they have a perception of spiritual awakening as being an earth shattering moment or instant in time, such as, well, hearing God's voice from a burning bush. And it just really doesn't happen like that. There may be an insight or a triggering event or a triggering experience, but the real awakening is usually a cumulative experience and process that leads to realizations that in turn take time to understand and lead to transformation. And it can take a while to incorporate the awakening into one's self-understanding and worldview. Instead of listening for the voice of God in a burning bush, I think the majority of Unitarian Universalists have a type of spiritual awakening that's resulted due to an expanded awareness, a lot of learning and paying attention beyond the confines of a religion or a god or a goddess or a scripture. Playing off that scene of the burning bush, Elizabeth Barrett Browning gets at this experience I think a lot of you use understand in Earth's Crammed with Heaven. Earth's crammed with heaven in every common bush of fire with God but only the one who sees takes off their shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. I think one of the awakenings a lot of Unitarian Universalists have is a coming realization that all things are holy. All kinds of religion and scripture and teachers have something valuable to contribute. And one of the things I think we all run into is that when we change, everything we see changes too. That can be difficult. Just coming to a Unitarian Universalist congregation can cause a lot of stress with one's extended family. I've heard that story many times as a minister. Awakening sometimes is not gentle. 
And one of the most difficult awakenings we're going to experience is the awakening to who we really are. The idea that the truth is not so much something we have to go find, but something that is in us. And we need to unlearn things and be who we truly are to find, in a sense, our own song. An awakening to that can take a lifetime. Many years ago, while preparing for ministry, I completed something called clinical pastoral education, or CPE. It's the supervised, practiced pastoral counseling and chaplaincy setting. And I served as the chaplain on an intensive care unit of a hospital in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. My CPE class was rather tiny. There were only four of us. Three of us had fairly similar worldviews and outlooks, even though we came from three different traditions. There was me. There was a woman studying to be a United Church of Christ congregational minister who also taught yoga and practiced Reiki. And there was a Sufi Muslim who wanted to be a hospital chaplain as a career. The fourth member of our small class was someone in a Christian seminary who was a very large man, always wore a black suit. He always carried a rather big leather bound Bible everywhere he went. One day our supervisor asked him, are you sure the Bible's big enough? <clears throat> he had all kinds of conservative types of bumper stickers on his car. His car and my car balanced each other out in the parking lot. <clears throat> he was about as opposite on a spectrum from the other three of us as you could possibly be. He was incredibly difficult to talk to. He was always trying to convert you, present to you the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You've run into some of these people, I'm sure, yourself before. And I don't begrudge anyone their religion, but there becomes a point after you've told somebody no that it's really tedious, right? And this was a kind of guy who just didn't get it. And we kept trying, we kept trying to get along with him, trying to include him. He wanted nothing of it. He thought we were all heathen, couldn't understand why we were being trained to be ministers and chaplains. You know, he insisted God was a male. He insisted gay people go to hell. You get the picture. We had a tough time with him. One weekend evening when I was not on call, I accompanied our Sufi friend to a big dinner where he lived not far away at a place called the Abode of the Message, which is the headquarters of the Sufi Order International. It was just over the New York border from where we were in Pittsfield in Massachusetts. And the event was a Sufi elder and master teacher from New Zealand was going to be there, and there was going to be a community dinner, and then she was going to give a short talk and answer questions on spirituality and Sufi and all this. Her name was Hamala McEwen, and she was an elder woman with long, flowing, gleaming white hair, and she had a presence you know, I would call regal. She was one of those people where, you know, if she, when she walked in the room, she commanded everyone's attention without saying or doing anything. I haven't run into too many of these people in my life. She's one of them. Sister Helen Prejean was one. Some human rights activists from South America were another. Not many like this. She was really captivating. Her dress was very light colored material. It kind of looked like it shimmered. She had this real appearance that was like almost angelic or elfin or something, almost otherworldly in a also commonplace way. And she gave a short talk after dinner and asked for questions. And people offered some questions about their lives and spiritual issues they were dealing with. And I don't remember too many of those specifics. But my Sufi friend decided to offer up the trouble we were having with our classmate. Our Bible-toting, Bible-thumping classmate. 
He explained how every conversation with him became an argument, how we tried to include him and form relationship with him, but he wanted no part of it, how he seemed to look down on us and spurn us, how he tried to impose his, what we all considered harmful theological ideas on us and on all his patients, which was even worse. And we just didn't get along with this guy, nor did we like him. And we were wondering if Halima McEwen had any insights. And she paused for a long minute and looked at both of us deeply. First my friend, and then me. And I will never forget what she said to us. You know, you can't force enlightenment on anyone. Of course, there was no way this guy with this huge black leather Bible he thumped was going to have enlightenment forced on him. Why were we trying so hard? Why were we so upset at our failure to connect? I heard her words. I thought I understood her ideas. But as the years went by, I began to awaken to the fact that I only partially understood what she said to us that night smug minister in training that I was, thought I had it all figured out, that my ways were the best ways. In my way, I was just as bad as this guy was, but I didn't see it. Hannah McEwen, wise Sufi elder that she was, was probably speaking to us, not about him. She was telling us that, you know, you can't force enlightenment on yourself. <laughs> Not about the problem we we're having with this guy. I was the unenlightened one. My friend was the unenlightened one. We couldn't force our eyes open. And this interpretation of what she said seems more and more and more real to me as the years go by, especially in light of what she said next. Stop worrying so much about what he's like and concentrate on how you treat him, how you react to him how you deal with your own reactions to him. He probably will never change much. And she raised a finger at us, but you can. Whew. You can't force enlightenment on anyone. You can't make anyone wake up. You can hold a candle up, blaze a torch, set an alarm clock, shine a spotlight but all we need is a little flame that just brightens the road in front of our next little step compassion is translated suffer with in that small interaction with hannah McEwen, halima McEwen, i began to criticize i began to stop criticizing our bible thumper I tried to peel myself back a little bit from him. I tried to have a little more compassion for him. At least I tried to let him not bother me so much. And I had to realize that I was as much in the dark in my ways as he was in his. The darkness was the same. He needed compassion to overcome his, and I need compassion to overcome mine. So I stumbled along my way, dimly lit, and I tried to improve my ability to suffer with him instead of just be, in a sense, angry at him. I'm not saying I think his ideas were as good as mine or his theology was as healthy as mine, but what we had all taken to was looking past his humanity because we disagreed with him. Of all the awakenings we experience, waking up to our true selves and the true nature of being human is the hardest. If you're anything like me, you will find at times yourself beating up on yourself for not living up to some spiritual or moral idea or ethic. And so you work on yourself. 
We work on ourselves. Isn't that an interesting term to use, we work on ourselves? As it's a chore, a job. And if we try hard enough, do the right things, find the right spiritual practice, pick the right religion, read the right books, our spirit, our soul, our deep personhood, our human nature will somehow magically improve all on its own. John O'Donohue, in his work Anamkara, a book of Celtic wisdom says, too often people try to change their lives by using the will as a kind of hammer to beat their life into the proper shape as they think it should be. The intellect identifies the goal of the program and the will accordingly forces the life into the proper shape. This way of approaching the sacredness of one's own presence is externalist and violent. It brings you falsely outside yourself. You can't find your song outside yourself. And Donahue says, you can spend years lost in the wilderness of your own mechanical spiritual programs. You can perish in a famine of your own making. You can starve in the middle of a feast. But, he says, if you work with a different rhythm, you come easily and naturally to yourself. Your soul knows the geography of your life. Your soul alone has a map. Thus you trust this indirect oblique side of yourself. If you do, it will take you where you need to go, but more importantly, it will teach you a kindness of rhythm for your journey of accepting yourself. <clears throat> What we need is inside us. Our job is to take off the layers we've learned to put over it, to be ourselves and stop trying to be everything we're not. I, I'm reminded of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in Douglas Adams, where he says, you know, the, the key to learning to fly is to throw yourself at the ground and miss. Many spiritual directors have given this type of advice for a long, long time. It is learning to see and trust what's inside us that is the biggest awakening. My favorite scripture verse is from the non-canonical, not in the Bible, Gospel of Thomas. It's saying 70. And it says, Jesus said, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is inside you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. You've got to find your song. Only you can find your song, and it's nowhere else but in you. Perhaps the big task of the spiritual life is learning to better listen to yourself. Parker Palmer gets this at in his book, Let Your Life Speak. He says, your soul knows when you are on the wrong path and it never stands for it. He suggests the deepest vocational question is not what ought I to do with my life, but who am I? What is my own nature? What is my song? The way I understand him, the quest is not what is the meaning of life, but what is the meaning of my life? And more importantly, not what gives meaning to my life, but who am I when I feel alive and full of meaning? Who is the me that sees every common bush afire with the divine? Who am I when I do hear and sing my own song? To help him find his vocation, Parker Palmer used the Quaker tradition of a clearness committee where you get a bunch of friends and bounce off what you're trying to decide. It helps you in talking to them hear your inner voice.
the difficult part of this is even when we learn to listen to ourselves, hear our song, and even sing it, the result is not always earth shattering. The Buddhist proverb before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, is maybe the most difficult part of the journey to get over. Life doesn't change, the proverb tells us. Only how we approach living can change. The tasks and experiences of being human don't change, but the way in which you live them and relate to them and experience them and process them and understand them can. Any transformative and powerful experience or event can wake us up and deeply affect how we see things. But sometimes it takes a while for that learned lesson to stick. We have to keep waking up every day and hitting the alarm clock, not just once. It's like a pilgrimage full of learning and new experiences, new places, new awarenesses. And over time on the journey, the things that have shifted settle into a new place. So it is now the new way you are. We begin to pay more attention to and to value simple everyday things. We more deeply appreciate relationship and connection and love. And sometimes the experience is painful or traumatic and we find ourselves withdrawing from daily life. And pain in that way can make us numb to our experience of everything. And we live in a bit of a fog. Sometimes even a powerful positive event leads to this numbness because daily life can't sustain the wonder and elation and happiness and excitement of our encounter with waking up. Sometimes the return to chopping wood and carrying water after we've had that awakening can seem worse in some ways. After every Zen retreat I've been on, the world outside the retreat seemed so loud so busy and so frenzied. It took me days to re-enter. Every time I've done one of these, been the same thing. It takes a week to just tolerate being around other people because it's so quiet and so intense and so focused. The reality of chop wood, carry water is both a wonderful and frustrating aspect of a spiritual awakening. Moments of great insight and a profound shift in perspective don't eliminate the need to pay the bills, buy the groceries, pick the children up from school, make dinner, tend the garden, walk the dog, and get to the church committee meeting on time. I threw that last one in. Awakenings are powerful and we are changed by their experience, but it's how we live after waking up that measures its impact on us. After waking up, do we continue to hit the snooze button and roll over going back to how we used to be? After waking up, we must still chop wood and carry water. Waking up means being more present to the moment, moment by moment, day by day. Thus, after enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water, but are more present to what we are doing when we do it. Before enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water to get the chores out of the way and get on with more important things. After enlightenment, we chop wood to chop the wood and we carry water to carry water. And we do the dishes to do the dishes. And my favorite one lately, we walk the dog to walk the dog. And in so doing, we become a bit more alive in each and every singular moment of our living. Thanks a lot for watching this video. It would help me out a great deal if you liked the video to give it a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this video with others, maybe ring that notification bell so you can be informed when we put out other videos like this. Thanks a lot again for watching. Until next time, go in peace.